It has been an interesting few days. I have so much to say, so I'm going to try and be terse. Sorry that it's taken so long to report. I really am trying. All of your questions and analysis of these events have really helped us through the struggle. Some of your observations are what brought me back here to Colorado. I landed in Denver International Airport two nights ago and stayed with Faye's parents in Nevada. While there, we all sat down and I basically forced them to tell me what was going on. A Redditor pointed out that Laura, Faye's mum, appeared to be lying or hiding something. Another Redditor asked me if Faye had been to the cabin before, since her family owned it for almost three decades. I had never even thought of this. When I asked Faye, she said no, and that her parents just used it as a getaway a few times a year. Faye's mum told me that she'd been there multiple times when she was little. This time, Faye's parents told me a different story. They claimed that this was the truth. Faye had been to the cabin as a toddler a few times, and when she was five, something happened to her. While Greg, Faye's dad, and Faye were outside playing in the snow, Faye wandered off toward the edge of the forest to look in. She was following a voice. Greg was building a snowman and keeping his eye on her. They were only a few dozen yards apart. Allegedly, Greg heard Faye talking, answering questions, but he couldn't hear anyone else talking. He started walking toward her to bring her back, and he heard her say, Faye, no it's Faye, I can't see you. A moment later, little Faye began shrieking and crying. She went as stiff as a board, and Greg had to pick her up and haul her back inside. She was almost catatonic, and would go through bouts of total silence or inconsolable hysterics for several hours, until Greg and Laura decided to go back down the mountain and take her to a hospital. Greg claims that he never saw anyone in the woods, and never heard any voices speaking to Faye. The doctors thought that she had an epileptic seizure, and to this day, Faye does not remember ever going to the cabin. When I took her, she acted like she'd never seen it before. I believe that if Faye did remember being traumatized as a child, she'd, she'd never want to go back. So, I really think she's blocked out the whole experience. And when we visited a week ago, she thought it was her first time going. In Laura and Greg's subsequent visits to the cabin without Faye, Greg experienced terrible nightmares in which dead people entered the bedroom and sat on the ground and bed, watching him sleep. In the morning, Greg let me borrow his truck, but refused to go to the cabin with me. He told me when I left, We let you kids go up here because we honestly wanted to believe that there was nothing actually wrong with the place. They used us to validate their denial, but... I don't hold them responsible. I'd never have believed any of this if I were them. Dreams in a frightened child do not make a haunting. I arrived in Pikes Peak around 1pm yesterday and the ranger met me at the cabin. We investigated the place and didn't find anything unusual except that a single lampshade had been removed from one of the lamps and placed on the couch. We checked out the nearby woods. I was kind of surprised to discover that the creepy, enormous dream catcher was still there. The ranger told me that he did not recognize it, and it was not something that his people made. He told me not to mess with it until his friend showed up. He told me he'd returned with them in the morning, and left. That night, some shit happened. Greg told me that he'd hidden a 357 Magnum in the closet, so I retrieved it and a really dope-ass purple bathrobe, and I felt a little better. Don't worry, I know how to shoot and how to keep it safe. Right around sunset, I walked out to Greg's truck to grab a few things I'd neglected to bring in earlier, and I heard two distinct voices chattering in the woods. It was snowing like crazy and the wind was howling, but above the storm, I heard a gruff, masculine voice and a younger, adolescent male voice. They were both yammering, incomprehensible gibberish from two different places. I hurried back inside and locked the door. 
The stuff they were saying was pure madness. It made no sense. Put them up, up there in the trees. And... Ah, take him, take. Walk down there, go ahead. I just sat there, imagining psychotic cannibals jabbering with their tongues hanging out and eyes rolled back in their skulls. I figured they'd come out of the woods as soon as it was dark. I tried to reach out to Faye back at home, but my phone wouldn't get any reception in the cabin. The storm was too strong. I tried to play video games on the snares, but I was so distracted by all of the sounds outside. Every single noise the blizzard produced caught my ear, and so my imagination manifested all kinds of horrifying creatures slinking around out there in the dark. When I finally went to bed, the wind died down a bit, and I heard a few more voices. There was a distant, high-pitched wail that echoed across the entire mountain. There was a child crying, saying something like, put me down in the hole and it's so deep you can crawl forever. But his voice sort of glitched. It would suddenly become deeper, as though a grown man were doing an impression of a little kid. I also heard someone hacking and vomiting and crying, begging for help. I didn't fall for any of it. I'm 28 years old, and this is the most afraid I've ever been in my entire life. Even with Faye walking around like a fleshy marionette and calling out to her presence in the dark of my own home. Around the time I was getting into bed, approximately 12.45am, there was a gentle tapping sound on the window in the living room. It was soft, like a neighbor who was reluctant to bother me. I stood there in the bedroom with the door open, holding my breath, trying to figure out if I'd imagined it. Then I heard it again, so I crept down the short hall and peeked around the corner, just in time to see a figure walking past the windows and toward the front door. With the curtains drawn, I couldn't make out anything but a big shadow. Then, it knocked on the door. It was a gentle knock. A man's voice called out softly. Hello? I just listened intently and tried to keep silent. Eventually he knocked again and said, Hello, I, I need to speak with you. He was speaking through clenched teeth. He was either extremely cold or extremely angry. I very carefully stepped back into the bedroom to grab the gun, but the place is so old, the doors creak. I barely tapped the bedroom door as I passed it, and it squealed like a dying pig. Then the man outside said, just above a whisper, I know you're there. For just a moment, in my lethargy, I considered the possibility that this was one of the ranger's friends, or maybe somebody else who lived on the mountain. I was never going to open the door, but stupidly, I figured talking to it couldn't hurt. I say it because... I immediately stopped believing that there was a human being on the other side of the door the moment I opened my mouth. I said, Who the fuck is it? As assertively as I could. The second I stopped talking, whoever it was out there repeated my question while mimicking my voice accurately. It almost sounded like an echo. Then he said, May I come in, please? His voice was a little shaky, but it definitely sounded like me, unnervingly similar to me. But he was still clenching his teeth, so I could hear the difference. I pointed the gun at the door. It was dark in the house, so he couldn't see what I was doing through the curtain, and said, If you don't get the fuck out of here right now, I'll blow you in half. For those of you who don't know what a 357 can do to a person, a slug to the chest essentially makes you into a human milkshake. And that's after passing through two inches of oak door. We both just stood there for a dreadfully long minute. It started testing out my voice, groaning and whispering and muttering. It said a lot of things, but I only remember a few of them. What's your name? 
What's your name? A little cabin for the weekend. For the weekend. For. And then a bunch of lip smacking and chewing noises. They're lying. They're lying. The ones out there. La 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 la. You aren't alone in there. I'm not alone out here. What's your name? You go up in the trees or down in the hole. That's where you go. Or they'll find you either way. The sound of my voice making these horrific noises and phrases set every inch of my skin on fire. I can hardly describe the physical sensation of fright this intense. It was almost like having a bad fever, hot and cold and wet and sticky all at the same time. I shouted for it to leave and said I was armed. I considered firing off a round, but that's a decision you can't take back. And my number one rule is to only fire when I'm certain I've got a target and clear reason. I am proud to say that I can use my voice a lot better than whatever it was that mimicked me. I'm a soft-spoken guy, but I came down like a fucking hurricane, screaming. I will fucking kill you! He replied simply, in a softer tone of my own voice. I will fucking kill you. Then it went back to babbling gibberish and knocking politely on the door over and over and over again. After another minute or two, it, it suddenly stopped. The last thing it said was, I know where she is. Then it kicked the door, and I mean harder than any human could possibly kick a door, and ran off. The boom was so loud, I couldn't believe the door didn't implode in its frame. The person or thing bounded down the wooden patio and off into the snow, and I swear on my life and honour, it sounded like a horse or some other huge four-legged animal charging off into the woods. A child's laughter rang out, and then everything was silent. Needless to say, I remained in a cat-like state of delirious paranoia for the rest of the night. The storm picked back up, and I did not hear anything else. I spent the whole night debating whether the thing at the door was talking about Faye. I tried to convince myself that it was just yammering more nonsense like all the voices I've heard up here before. But the way it spoke that sentence haunts me even now as I share this. Its voice, my voice, was purposeful and restrained. It chose the words carefully and it knew exactly what to say. I've been thinking a lot about what Redditors have been saying about Faye being some kind of doppelganger. When I first saw the nude woman on my car, I thought it was a trick to lure me into the woods where the voices lie. I thought that the real Faye stopped me from leaving the cabin, but many of you have pointed out that the reverse could be entirely possible, given how the Faye I took home to California is behaving, given how she has failed all of my tests. And given how her engagement ring has been missing since we got home. So I sat there for hours, considering whether I should go out into the woods during broad daylight to search for my fiancé. Of course, it is a stupid idea, but now I understand why people in horror movies do idiotic things. If I'm not looking for her or for answers, why am I here? I need to know what I saw that day in the driveway. I need to know if there are many voices or just one, and I need to know how to get all this back to normal. I listened to music on my iPod and desperately tried to distract myself by reading news articles online until daybreak. Most of them wouldn't load because the gods of internet have cursed this cabin. Around 4am, I got up to get some food from the kitchen, and I opened the window curtain just a tiny bit to see if anything was going on outside. A ton of snow had fallen. At the rim of the forest, dozens of yards out, I could see a distant figure standing perfectly still in the moonlight. He was facing away, staring off into the darkness of the woods. I checked on him every 20 minutes since then. He never moved. When the sun rose around 6.15am, he was gone. I never saw his face.
Today the ranger and his two buddies came to the cabin as promised. They were instantly likable and warm. One of them, Taiwi, is a medicine man in his 50s and was especially cool. The other was his son, Nathan, who was probably just a few years older than me. They told me all kinds of interesting lore about Pikes Peak and the surrounding areas and then proceeded to tell me a disturbing story that they believe explains the strange activity on the mountain. For the sake of brevity, I will relay this in my next post. The ranger gave me one of his facility satellite phones to stay in contact with him in case of emergencies. I used it to call Faye, but she didn't answer, so I called Jason and Richard, who were presently caring for her. Apparently Faye had become inexplicably outraged after taking a shower, threw an enormous tantrum, and locked herself in our bedroom. She refused to eat for the rest of the night. Allison and Jason slept in the guest room, and Richard, he slept on our couch downstairs and worked late on his commissions. He's a digital artist. He told me that around 1am, the same time I had my visitor, Faye ran downstairs into the kitchen, eyes closed and started drinking out of the sink faucet. Then she turned around and stared. I still shut at Richard while he sat at the breakfast table. She said, Felix? To which he replied, He's in Colorado, Faye, remember? And then she said, We sent him there to die. Then she sat down right there on the kitchen tiles and went back to sleep. I've instructed my friends only to wake Faye if she does anything serious so they observed my rules and got her back into bed without much of an issue. For all the crazy shit Faye does when she's asleep, at least she never gets violent. The guys put her back into bed easily enough. The next day, Allison bailed on the whole project. She said she was awake all night, listening to Faye whispering through the wall. Faye told Allison about how there was a man in the house, and he was asking about her. My flight home is the day after tomorrow, so I'm going to have to figure out all this shit really quick. I'm going to go and take a nap. It's nice and bright outside, and there's no voices. Good night. P.S. As soon as I get home, I'll put up the Fay video. I know I keep saying this, but I really did not expect to suddenly return to Colorado. I swear I will put it up, and then that will be the end of it. I resent myself for turning this into such a long and ridiculous blog of my experiences. Taiwi is an incredible storyteller. He told me that Pikes Peak and the surrounding area was inhabited by the Ute, Minotau, Arapaho, Pueblo, Anasazi, and other Native American groups at various times. In the 1860s, when the gold rush was in full swing, many Indians were violently displaced because of the mining operations there. They were torn away from their sacred lands, which was catastrophic to their cultures. Taiwi stressed that, historically, Americans have not understood the significance of land and names to Native Americans, and this is critical to understanding the supernatural presence on the mountain. The major world religions like Christianity and Hinduism and Islam are universal. They can be practiced anywhere. You can pick up your whole life and move to Kentucky or Scotland or Istanbul and you'll still be whatever religion you are. Your God still hears your prayers. He still intervenes in your life. But Native Americans practice land-based religions. The land they inhabit is part of their creation stories. It's not that the land belongs to them. It's that they belong to the land, and both are in a symbiotic relationship with one another. History is embedded in the landscape. A person is reminded of specific lessons and wisdom when they see a part of the land. The mouth of this river has a story attached to it. The fallen tree has a story attached to it. A battle was won here. A chief died there. Peace was made between tribes with a feast here. When a native group is forced out of its homeland, the people lose their history. What's worse, they leave behind the places where their dead are buried. Since the dead are bound to that place, the Indians who left no longer have spiritual connections to their ancestors 
and thus, to their gods, their medicines and magic no longer work. They forget the names of sacred places. As the names and history and wisdom are forgotten, the tribe's spiritual power evaporates. Taiwi said that when Pike's Peak was taken, a group of disgruntled Utes descended on the miners and slaughtered a bunch of them. Because a complex network of alliances and peace treaties, these Utes were punished by another tribe. They dug holes in the ground and slit the Utes' throats. Then, they buried them upside down in the holes with their legs sticking out of the ground so that wolves would feast on their calves. That was supposed to be the end of it, but then something else happened. The legend says that these dead Utes arose from the tainted ground one night. Because their flesh had been flayed from the hips down, they looked like walking skeletons. They hobbled into the Arapaho camps and took women and children back up the mountain. They forced them deep into one of the mines, never to leave again. The house of women and children have been reported on the mountain for over a hundred years now. The Utes and Arapaho engaged in blood feuds, sometimes called mourning wars, for years over this. They exchanged curses, executed and skinned and tortured each other. They stained the once scarred earth on Pike's Peak with rivers of blood. I just kind of sat there with the ranger while Tywi and Nathan blessed the cabin. They burned sage and tobacco inside and outside and used crushed herbs to dust cover their hands. They made a handprint on every window and drew small symbols in ash at the top of the front door, inside and outside. They gave me bundled sage, cedar, hawthorn and told me to burn it if anyone tried to get inside. It drives bad spirits insane. Then, they provided me with small pouches filled with herbs and blessed objects to wear around my neck and in my pockets whenever I went outside. Nathan gave me a totem that he wears around his neck and told me to give it to Faye. Then they sang a really incredible chant in their language. It lasted about 15 minutes. I was blown away. I fucking love these guys. Then we went outside. I showed them the Dreamcatcher, and they told me that they had never seen anything like it. The Dreamcatcher is made with three branches woven together with hair, and it has old yarn or wool string with glass beads crisscrossing the center in a pattern. It is old and handmade. Taiwi told me not to touch it or move it. If you find an object of power and do not know who made it or what it protects, you should leave it alone. I asked him if it could be evil, and he said maybe. I got them up to speed on everything that has happened. I said that a lot of my friends... Redditors, but I didn't explain that, suspected that Faye at my house in California was a duplicate and that the real Faye was somewhere in the woods. Tywi and Nathan disagreed with each other on whether that could be, but we searched the woods looking for signs of my Faye. I told them about the missing ring and they said exactly what many Redditors have said. If Faye loved the ring and it was powerfully symbolic to her, it could be used by a bad spirit to harm her. They told me to find it, at all costs. They also told me that if Faye indeed were still here on the mountain, she was certainly dead. Tywi named the creature that was tormenting us. He said his people called it Ataan A Anatakua, or the Imposter. Bad spirits inhabit the land everywhere, and sometimes they get the opportunity to use a tragedy like the Pikes Peak Massacres to commandeer a human figure and walk the earth partly mortal. In the case of the imposter, they collect animal and human parts piecemeal wherever they can and stitch them together. This is why they walk strangely, vocalize strangely, and why they never show their faces or come out during the day. They cannot pass for humans. I asked Taiwi why I always see someone facing away from me at the edge of the forest, and he said that it's because it does not want me to know its identity. But eventually, the imposter would come for me, wearing face skin and teeth and hair, and try to convince me that it was her. When I asked him what it wanted, he said, Nobody knows. 
He also told me that there is power in names, as many Redditors have stated, and that I should not speak its name, especially not to it, because that could provoke it. Of the voices I was hearing in the forest every night, Taiwi said, They practice what they hear for decades. It makes it easier for them to hunt. Taiwi Nathan and the ranger left at sunset, and I spent the rest of the evening thinking about all of this, and I think I figured a lot of things out. Around 9pm, something disturbing happened. I used the satellite phone the ranger gave me to call Faye. She actually answered and was just lying in bed reading. We had a great conversation. I told her that I missed her so much and that I was up here trying to solve what was happening. I told her I wanted to have a family with her. She said that she was feeling better and had actually gone a whole night without sleepwalking or terrifying Jason and Richard my buddies who are looking after her while I'm here in Colorado. After about 15 minutes of talking, I started hearing sounds outside. I heard footsteps crunching in the dry snow, and I heard a voice, my voice. It said things like, flight, insomnia, miss you, see you soon. The thing had been standing near the window, mimicking my conversation with Faye, I told Faye I'll call her back later and hung up the phone, then went silent. The thing walked around the cabin slowly, trying to figure out if I had moved and kept mumbling and repeating a few phrases as it went. Finally, it came and knocked on the door. Its knock was gentle, just like last night. I was a little bit less scared because of all the blessings Tywi had put on the cabin but I still held on to the gun just in case any shit went down. He spoke to me in my own voice, and the first thing he said was, The hole will fill with snow and blood. So yeah, that amped up my fear quite a bit. Every hair on the back of my neck bristled. Do you know the feeling of being so scared that your vision turns hyper real? Everything looks like a realistic video game so everything looks just slightly off. Then, it knocked again and said, Hello, may I come in? I simply said, No, leave. Then it knocked for another 30 seconds or so and said, What is your name? Hello? I lied and said, My name is Daniel, now leave, you can't come in. The thing started knocking harder, a lot harder, non-stop, and said, What is your name? What is your name? It was terrifying to hear my voice coming from the other side of the door, and to hear rage building in that voice. I said again, My name is Daniel. But the thing just kept yammering and asking the same question. It would occasionally say things like, Ticket, ticket, rental car, the hole, the hole, down in the hole. What is your name? May I know your name? Then I had an idea. I'm really good with fake accents. And when I was a child, my first language was German. Dad immigrated to Boston and met my mum there. I started speaking in a thick accent, talking about my day, and then started shouting in German. I recited a poem I know by Hermann Heise. Die Frauen von Ravina Tragen. My visitor went silent and stopped knocking. I could tell it was just listening. So, then I started shouting in a British accent, reciting lines from V from Vendetta, my favorite film of all time. I shouted thank you in every single language I know. My unwanted guest just sort of stammered a little bit, trying to mimic me but failed to do so. I was no longer speaking in any recognizable pattern or tone. Eventually, it just started growling the sounds Faye and I heard in the forest when we first stayed at the cabin, the wall my, wall my, and started scratching and pounding on the door. I grabbed the sage bundle and torched it with my lighter, then waved it all around the doorframe. I don't know if the thing outside could smell it, 
but it walked off the porch all pissed off, growling, and went off into the night. This time, I ran to the window and tried to get a glimpse of it, but all I could see was a very dark, amorphous form disappearing into the trees. I think I've figured a lot of stuff out. I think this entity is mimicking me because it's going to try and convince Faye that it is me. It is rehearsing my voice and then whispering to Faye while she sleeps, talking to her in her dreams, trying to get her to let it inside of our house. I think it wants to convince her that I am the imposter, not it. I think I also figured out why the voices go crazy at night and why they're getting closer to the home. These fuckers aren't trying to scare me. They're trying to deprive me of sleep. If I'm psychologically and emotionally drained, I'm weaker. If I'm delirious, I'll make a mistake. Their or his attempts to get me will be easier. I'm still trying to figure out how controlling Faye like a puppet in her sleep plays into all this. I know what I saw. There was a man standing outside our house, walking the exact same creepy way Faye was sleepwalking at the exact same time. I'm also still considering the possibility that I already made a terrible mistake and that the imposter has already won. When I went outside on the first night at the cabin with Faye, trying to see where the voices were coming from, I... I left the door unlocked. A Redditor said that that was the moment that Faye was replaced by something else. I... just don't know what to think. But for now, I'm going the fuck to sleep. Update, 30th of April. Well, I found the ring. <laughs>